meanwhile, this inflation theory has been uh, being developed and connected to string theory and various other elaborations of the particle physics we know. And this was the result, a multiverse, uh, telling us that we live in a patch of universe which may be different than other patches of the universe. And this multiverse has gradually become the most unpredictive, uh, unscientific theory uh, of all time. And that worries me a great deal. So this catastrophe of modern theory uh, simultaneously has come along with stunning simplicity in the measurements of the universe. So in the case of the dark energy, it is converging on this very, very simplest possibility that the vacuum has an energy which is the same everywhere and immutable, doesn't change. Can't get any, anything simpler than that. The Planck satellite measurements are showing us those fluctuations on the sky coming out of the early universe. Those fluctuations take the simplest possible form. They take the form of what we call Gaussian random noise. It's basically the simplest type of fluctuation which contains no further information in it. It's like a random pattern of waves on the sea. It's crazy. But, it, but Neil, it's isn't it simpler. interesting it's that inflation than... predicts Gaussian random fluctuation? No, it doesn't. Okay, good. <laughs> inflation isn't a scientific theory. Inflation, <laughs> inflation comes in a thousand different varieties. Most Each of which one of predict which... random Gaussian fluctuation. No, there's no most, well, because most you know the, simpler, the simplest ones, yeah, the simplest ones are now close to being ruled out. By, uh, precisely by the Planck satellite measurements and the failure to confirm gravitational waves. So whereas inflation is predicting this multiverse, uh, gravitational waves, it allows theories, uh, many different fields, it allows the composition of the universe to vary from place to place, uh, that's not what the observations are pointing to. They're pointing to a tremendous simplicity. So I find this incredibly encouraging for fundamental theory because the universe is turning out to be simpler than we thought, simpler than we expected, and it's compelling us to try to come up with a new explanation. It's, it's shocking that there's, no, there's nothing close to a consensus among physicists and cosmologists as to whether the universe has an infinite past or a finite past. Um, and you have to, and Neil, I mean, uh, I, you're a somewhat dissentient voice. It, yeah. it should be made clear to the audience that the consensus on the theory of inflation among your fellow physicists is slightly against you. Oh, uh, yes. Which means nothing, of course. Consensus means nothing, of course, in science. Um, that that, that but gives I, me a better chance of being right. Yeah, right, 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 right. Um, Yes, the, I, the, I the majority think, view yeah. is uh, strongly in favor of inflation. I think the last uh, 20 or 30 years, we've seen huge bandwagons in physics. String theory is another bandwagon. Uh, by and large, these bandwagons have failed, well, not by and large, totally, they have failed, <laughs> they have failed to deliver. Uh, as I say, the observations have indicated the universe is amazingly simple. Well, it, you'll have to explain this. If you're saying <laughs> it these, doesn't these, these require models have failed, dimensions. why would most physicists buy into it? The the well, there, there's a sociological phenomenon that, you know, if you have a, a theory which allows a lot of scope, for playing with it, it has all this arbitrariness. Uh, you can write thousands and thousands of papers, and all your friends can write papers, and you all cite each other. This is just a reality. This is not uh, saying very much for the way science works. Uh, people do what they can, you know, and uh, I, I think it's understandable. Um, but uh, at some point, you've got to stand back from this, uh, you know, endless production of uh, scientific papers and, and so on and say, are we really heading towards a discovery here? Or are we just recycling the same old ideas with very minor tweaks? And I'm afraid there's much too much of the latter. The multiverse is very popular these days. I mean, my sense is that uh, a fairly high percentage of theoretical physicists would, would say, yes, there is a multiverse here. Whereas my sense is that <laughs> 10 or 20 years ago, that was largely a fringe idea. Well, as I say, I draw great optimism from that fact. I think people, the majority of the physics, theoretical physics community, are very confused. And most physicists think that way. Why would most physicists buy into the multi- Because you can publish your papers. Is the three-dimensional world an illusion? 
in the same sense that a hologram is an illusion? Perhaps. I think, I'm inclined to think, yes, that the three-dimensional world is a kind of illusion and uh, that the ultimate precise reality is the two-dimensional reality at the surface of the universe. But that move to this higher level that would bring together gravity and particle physics came with a price that it was much harder to link to experiment. And this created a real debate within the mm -hmm. physics community. And people began to say, is this physics? Now, from my perspective as a historian, I'm always interested in points where people say, is this physics? Because, well, sometimes it's just obviously not physics, but sometimes <laughs> it's a sense that there's something deep underground going on and a change in what science is after. It's a question of where to look for unity. Uh, the biologists who had uh, the, uh, the Z5 principle, that's a symmetry group, Z5 is the symmetry of the pentagram, uh, they simply were looking for unification in the wrong place. They were looking for it in the body structure of, uh, of large animals. The, the unification did occur. The unification mm -hmm. was the unification of DNA. So there is a unified theory of life. It just wasn't where people were looking for it. I think the same is likely to be true in physics. Uh, there will, hopefully, I would hope, there will be some unified description of this entire complex of possibilities. You have to know where to look for unity. You can't expect to find unity more than once. And then if there's another nearby minimum on the landscape, a bubble may form inside the bubble. Bubbles inside bubbles inside bubbles. There's a mathematics to this. The mathematics has been largely worked out by my colleague Andre Linde and uh, Alan Guth and other famous cosmologists. And what they find is that if you wait long enough, the entire landscape will eventually get populated by this bubbling structure which eventually fills up with essentially every possibility that could be there. If that's the case, the question of why the universe is the way it is settles down to the question of how come we're in the kind of universe that we're in, in, if they're all out there. And the answer at minimum must be that we can only live in certain kinds of environments. And not surprisingly, we're in the kind of environment that we can live in. Most of us at an earlier time had hoped that there would be a small number of principles which would explain everything about the universe, all the parameters of it and everything else, and now we're saying, my god, it's no better than biology or zoology. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that I don't know if everyone appreciates what was at stake. And I think that what we're referencing about this idea of unification was totally based on the idea of symmetries, that there were always going to be symmetries, and these symmetries would yield the correct theory, and there would be one theory that was explained by this symmetry. And the symmetry uh, would describe everything. And this was, wasn't just a fantasy. It was remarkably successful. And we're all coming to this strange position where it's not reducing. It is not reducing to one symmetry group. And it's, it's unnerving because it's how we were all educated, essentially. And it was what we all celebrated. And on the success of that, um, and in the midst of that celebration, we wanted to find you know, the great unified idea which would continue in that spirit. So this is um, the reason why it is such a, a knock to a lot of physicists to have to confront their, the idea that maybe there really isn't a fundamental description of the universe. I would argue that anything that happens in the universe at early times will produce a signal that is identical to that from inflation. And the simplest example I want to give you is, is a simple example that I, that I thought of about 20 years ago almost. Let's imagine that it, after inflation, say, there's some global phase transition, a scalar field has a phase transition. There are lots of phase transitions happening in the universe. And this means that you could have, after inflation, a phase transition that would, in fact, produce gravitational waves which would overwhelm the signal due to, due to inflation and would look identical in principle. Or would they? We don't know. And you could do a simple order of magnitude calculation. So this means at all times, in this model, let me make this clear, at all times, gravitational waves are being generated. The phase transition may have happened at 10 to the minus 30 seconds after the Big Bang. But today, gravitational waves are being generated on our horizon because our horizon is growing and different regions are coming into contact. And on, those, on the scale of our horizon, gravitational waves are being generated. So while, while the ability to prove inflation goes away, it's interesting. And so 
we may have to give up falsifiability for inflation. We may never be able to find anything that unambiguously tells us inflation happened, but we still may think we're doing good physics. We're going to be probing the universe at new scales. Okay, that's as good as it gets. It's going to go downhill now.